The following broadcast is released under a Creative Commons license. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of God. I believe He lived and died, and that He rose again. I believe and trust in Him. Ascended into hell, Christ our living head will one day come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe and trust in Him. I will trust in my Redeemer, sing of His love. That lasts forever Know His hope And sure salvation I will trust in Him Oh, the world falls around me I rest and know That He has found me Christ, the rock, is my Welcome all to Pastor Yeshua. You've been listening to Creed by Richard Jensen from his album, Order of Service. By way of introduction, Pastor is an acrostic which stands for Preaching All Salvation Through One Redeemer. Our Redeemer, Yeshua, Jesus, is the Hebrew name for the Lord. It means Yahweh, the Lord, is salvation. Translated from Hebrew into the Greek language, the name Yeshua becomes Jesus. The English transliteration for Jesus is Jesus. This program deals with apologetics, questions on and about God, the Bible, and the Christian faith. I take questions and seek by Scripture to give answers and encouragement for everyone, including the tough-minded living in today's skeptical society. And now, let's join Pastor Yeshua. Welcome to Pastor Yeshua. In this episode, and by God's grace, episodes to follow, we revisit a popular topic wherein we continue to look at various apparent supposed Bible contradictions presented by atheists, skeptics, and humanists. As before, we will examine them against what the Bible says in context according to proper exegesis using the languages in question, correct grammar, the culture of the day, and, most importantly, the prism of spiritual discernment given by God to those who truly desire to understand His revelation of Himself and His relationship to man. As a prelude to answering any apparent Bible contradictions, if you, as a listener, have not done so already, Listening to the introductory episode regarding questions about contradictions will be an indispensable prologue to fully understanding, or more importantly, answering any question or apparent contradiction which exists. Therefore, I will have to rely from this point forward on the listener to faithfully adopt the biblical posture of the Berean Bible student who is willing and able to do their own respective homework in order to avoid the pitfalls inherent from failing to do so. In the episodes to date, we have examined and answered 33 questions regarding supposed Bible contradictions from our old friend, Mr. Ash, the atheist, skeptic, and humanist. In this episode, we continue to help Mr. Ash with his various questions regarding the veracity and consistency of God's Word, the Bible. With this in mind, let us consider addressing the following questions about apparent contradictions, 
put forth by Mr. Ash. For our next randomly selected question, Mr. Ash asks, is God nature good or evil? In order to set up this apparent contradiction, Mr. Ash quotes the following verses. Psalm 145, verse 9, quote, The Lord is good to all, and his tender mercies are over all his works, unquote. Also, Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, quote, He, referring to God, is the rock. His work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment. A God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he, unquote. Mr. Ash then compares the following verses to achieve his supposed contradiction. Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, quote, I, referring to God, form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things, unquote. Lamentations chapter 3, verse 38, quote, out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good, unquote. Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 11, quote, Now, therefore go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way, and make your ways and your doings good." Unquote. Finally, Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 25 and 26, quote, Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live, and I polluted them in their own gifts, in that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb that I might make them desolate, to the end that they might know that I am the Lord." Unquote. Now, as we begin to deal with the biblical definitions and understandings of such labels as quote-unquote good and quote-unquote evil, we need to remind ourselves that at the outset it is a prerequisite that we have an ultimate source of authority by which to do so. If we do not have an ultimate source, or the source is flawed, then the results will vary, if not be absent altogether. The issue for Mr. Ash when it comes to good and evil is that Mr. Ash imagines that he is in authority of defining these terms. Since God does not do what Mr. Ash approves of, Mr. Ash concludes that God is the problem and not Mr. Ash. Foundationally, as we look at the various aspects of evil, it cannot be stressed enough that the existence and the effects of evil in all of its ramifications would not exist were it not for man and his choice to take his faith and trust off God and instead eat of the forbidden fruit of the knowledge of good and evil. So Mr. Ash bears the responsibility for the consequences of his own choice then and now. Another problem is that Mr. Ash fails to recognize that the terms good and evil are relative depending on their context, the purpose, and the outcome. Mr. Ash forgets that while God is interested and involved with the immediate affairs of man, God's primary concern is the eternal state of man and man's relationship to God. To put it simply, Mr. Ash fails to distinguish between an event or events which temporally may appear to be evil, 
while the ultimate purpose and outcome, according to God, might be called good. This is what Romans chapter 8, verse 28 would contend. Quote, And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and to them who are called according to his purpose, unquote. So the reality that ultimately God is in control of all things, including those events which could be labeled as evil, does not infer that God is evil or that he is lacking morality because evil happens. Instead, in keeping with Romans chapter 8, verse 28 and other passages, we know that by virtue of the fact that God is in control of all things, including evil, that the presence of quote-unquote evil events in the affairs of man has a purpose and meaning which would not be the case if God were not in control of them. In a broader sense, God is controlling the flow and events of evil which man has chosen and opened the door to in order to restore and achieve his plan of salvation for those who are his adoptive children. By an admittedly pale analogy, God's ultimate control of evil would be akin to seeing someone who is immediately about to step in front of a speeding car and be killed. For God's purpose, he chooses for this person to trip and to fall, skinning their knee, but preventing them from proceeding forward and being killed. In this scenario, if the one tripping is finite, and knows nothing of the future, then without context, it would be easy to conclude that God is evil since he has purposed that someone falls and is injured. With this brief analogy in mind, let's look at Isaiah chapter 45, verse 7, which says, quote, I, referring to God, form the light and create darkness. I make peace and create evil. I, the Lord, do all these things." Unquote. Here, in this verse, it should be noted that the verse has two contrasts, light and darkness, peace and evil. The two sets are intended to represent the logical ends in either direction and by deduction, the idea of everything that is in between. So, as theorized thus far, this verse gives us a truthful statement by the writer that God forms, creates, and controls all things ultimately, including those things which man labels as good and evil in a limited context, but which serve his ultimate purpose, which is always good. However, in context with the remaining verses and with the Bible as a whole, God is never creating, approving of, or sanctioning evil because his nature is evil or because God enjoys it. If and when God allows situations which man calls as evil, they always happen as a result of one or more of the following things. Number one, most, if not all, moral, ethical, and existential quote-unquote evil are as a result of Satan and or sin. However, Satan, sin, rebellion, and any other thing never operate apart from the ultimate authority and sovereign will of God for his overall purpose of good. 2. Evil things happen as a logical result and consequence of man's individual or societal choices and behavior relative to God. 3. 
evil things happen as a necessary pathway by which all men must pass because of the general effects of sin, rebellion, and the fall upon mankind and this world. 4. Evil is a temporary and or temporal situation which exists in order that God may eventuate his greater good and ultimate sovereign will thereby. Finally, five, evil, like everything else, is an opportunity whereby man may be tried, purified, and grow by greater faith, trust, and reliance on God, and thereby have greater reason to glorify God. Now, as we move on, next we have Lamentations chapter 3, verse 38. Quote, Out of the mouth of the Most High proceedeth not evil and good? Unquote. Once again, here we see the reality that God is in control of all things, including evil. In this case, Mr. Ash predictably fails to recognize the genre and backdrop of the Book of Lamentations. The main theme of Lamentations is the destruction and the taking captivity of Jerusalem and its inhabitants, God's people. Both of these events were as a direct result of Israel repeatedly disobeying, dishonoring, and rebelling against God, despite the fact that God repeatedly warned Israel that this would be the consequences if Israel failed to repent. Verse 39, which immediately follows this quote, and which Mr. Ash ignores, says this very thing. Quote, Wherefore doth a living man complain, a man for the punishment of his sins? Unquote. Hence we learn that the quote-unquote evil of destruction and captivity upon Israel here is because Israel has chosen it via its rebellion. As we subsequently learn, the destruction and captivity, as is a result of all evil, in this case of God's elect, is there ultimately to humble God's people and return them to fellowship. As before, the evil is not a moral failing on God's part, but if in fact evil is afoot, it is there as part of the reason and the purpose, according to God's will, to accomplish His perfect will, as stated earlier. The fact that God may not be broadcasting and explaining the reason in particular in many cases for whatever quote-unquote evil, real, or supposed that man experiences, does not negate this fact. Next we have Jeremiah chapter 18, verse 11. Quote, Now, therefore, go to, speak to the men of Judah and to the inhabitants of Jerusalem, saying, Thus saith the Lord, Behold, I frame evil against you and devise a device against you. Return ye now every one from his evil way and make your ways and your doings good. Unquote. So here in Jeremiah, we see the conversation and the warning from God to Israel regarding their future, which finds its ultimate fulfillment in Lamentations. Mr. Ash would attempt to convince himself and others that the quote-unquote evil and or the quote-unquote good which God is in control of is in a vacuum. Mr. Ash wants to pretend that the problem is a capricious, arbitrary, immoral God, when in fact, man is the issue. Mr. Ash here fails again to disclose the preceding verses to Jeremiah 18.11. In verse 18.8, we read, quote, If that nation against whom I have pronounced turn from their evil, 
I will repent of the evil that I thought to do unto them, unquote. In verses 9 and 10, we read, quote, And at what instant I speak concerning a nation and concerning a kingdom, to build and to plant it, if it do evil in my sight that it obey not my voice, then I will repent of the good wherewith I said I would benefit them, unquote. So in both verses preceding Jeremiah 18.11, we learn that the logical consequences of failing to abide in the covering grace and goodness of God through faith and obedience is to open oneself to the axiomatic result, which is any manner of evil. Yet, because God is faithful to himself, those who are ultimately God's people will have all things work together to their good and to God's glory, even though those things may, for the moment, seem by all accounts to be evil. Finally, we have Ezekiel chapter 20, verses 25 and 26, which says, quote, Wherefore I gave them also statutes that were not good, and judgments whereby they should not live. And I polluted them in their own gifts, in that they caused to pass through the fire all that openeth the womb, that I might make them desolate, to the end that they might know that I am the Lord." Unquote. Here, amazingly, Mr. Ash completely ignores 47 of 49 verses to focus exclusively on the two quoted. Here, Mr. Ash takes issue with the word quote-unquote desolate, which Mr. Ash assumes is a completely arbitrary act of God. If there is a cause, then Mr. Ash assumes that the desolation must be God's moral failing and not man's. However, in reality, we have an entire chapter devoted as a repeated plea and warning by God to his people who are engaged in repeated abominations, false idol worship, rebellion, abandonment, defilement, child sacrifice to false gods, infidelity, evil behavior, wickedness, and corruption. God also promised that if they shall repent, that his people will be blessed. And if they continue to rebel, they will suffer the consequences. So, like the quote-unquote evil, the quote-unquote desolation in Ezekiel is as a result and a consequence to man's rebellion, not God's moral desire to exercise evil which is part of his nature and attributes. In conclusion, we must understand and remember that what we label humanly as quote-unquote evil is at best temporal in the larger scheme of things. God will eventually eliminate death, evil, and suffering in the eternal state for his elect. In the meantime, evil, death, and suffering serve to judge and punish the wicked, while at the same time they serve to refine and give opportunity to God's elect. There is therefore no contradiction regarding evil. There is only an inability to understand evil in its context and purpose due to Mr. Ash's unregenerate nature and finite reasoning. For the next randomly selected apparent contradiction, Mr. Ash asks, was Haziah 22 or 42 years old when he began to reign? In order to create this supposed contradiction, Mr. Ash quotes the following verses. 2 Kings chapter 8, verse 26. Quote, two and twenty years old was Hazaya when he began to reign, 
and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Ahathaliah, the daughter of Omri, king of Israel, unquote. Mr. Ash then compares this to Second Chronicles, Second Chronicles chapter 22, verse 2, which says, quote, Forty and two years old was Ahaziah when he began to reign, and he reigned one year in Jerusalem. His mother's name also was Ahathaliah, the daughter of Omri, unquote. Now, in the case of this question, there is actually more than one possible answer. In the first case, the differing ages of Haaziah can be explained by the different perspectives of the two books in question. Since Chronicles focuses on Judah, Chronicles gives the age of 42 when Haaziah began to reign after the death of Jehoram, the king of Judah. The book of Kings focuses on both Israel and Judah and consequently gives the age of 22 when Hezekiah began to reign as co-regent of Israel together with Jehoshaphat. Since Chronicles does not focus on Israel, its account is not concerned with the 20 years of Hezekiah's co-regency in Israel. This verse preceding 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 2, in verse 1, says, quote, And the inhabitants of Jerusalem made Haziah his youngest son king in his stead, unquote. The context of 2 Chronicles 22 makes it clear that Haziah's kingship is counted from his ascendancy to the throne in Jerusalem, at which time he was 42 years old. On the other hand, in 2 Kings chapter 9, verse 29, after Haziah's death, there is a posthumous retelling that, quote, in the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab began Haziah to reign over Judah, unquote. Such a posthumous description of where the kings reigned only happens for Haziah. It is here, for the first time in the book of Kings, we are told that Haziah reigned over Judah. It is as if the author later had to make it clear that Haziah reigned over Judah during the time period in question because there was cause for confusion about where he reigned at a given time. This would be the case if Isaiah had reigned over Israel at some point in time in some capacity. A second possibility is that the supposed contradiction could be as simple as a copyist slash scribal error. The Masoretic, Syriac, an Arabic text of the Old Testament all list 22 as the age given in 2 Chronicles chapter 22 verse 2 which would agree with 2 Kings chapter 8 verse 26 as you will recall as described in the introduction to questions about contradictions we reviewed the various issues inherent to the job of copying the Bible referred to as the scribal process. While we know that the copies of 2 Chronicles chapter 22, verse 22 and 900 AD spell out the age as, quote, 20 and 2, unquote, prior to this, if as is likely, the passages had the ages 42 and 22 been written in numeric form prior to being spelled out, this discrepancy could easily creep in because the symbol for 40, which looks like the English lowercase n, and the symbol for 20, which looks like a backwards English lowercase c, are very similar and would consequently be very susceptible to scribal error. 
Now, at the cost of repeating ourselves, Mr. Ash will at this point jump up on his pogo stick and shout, Aha! Got you! You said that the Bible is the infallible and inerrant word of God. Yet here you admit that there are errors. Which is it? Well, to this we happily respond, Dear Mr. Ash, the answer is that ultimately, in the strictest literalist sense, the only time we can use the terms infallible and, and inerrant is when we are talking about the original revelations of God's Word to man and the original autographed writers to whom they were inspired. Secondly, when we say infallible and inerrant, we are talking about the theological and doctrinal issues of the Bible, which are for the purposes of sufficiently revealing the truth and reality of the nature of God and our relationship to him, creation, fall, redemption, and restoration. So we can and do have minor scribal errors attributable to human limitations which do exist, none of which affect the veracity, legitimacy, or trustworthiness of God's word regarding the theological, doctrinal issues related to salvation, which is the purpose of God's word. If Mr. Ash is going to be consistent, then Mr. Ash must also disavow and destroy any and all scientific publications which contain any misprints, however small. Further, Mr. Ash must reject science since the presence of said flaws demonstrates that science cannot be trusted. Yet, if truth be told, if we looked through history, we could and would likely find scientific publications which would contain more misprints, misspellings, and grammatical errors within any 20-year period than does the Bible, relatively speaking, in over 2,000 years. In all, to date, in this series, we have, in each case, serious questions posed by various individuals who hold themselves out to be scholars, critical thinkers, intellectuals, and the like, who collectively fall under the pseudonym of Mr. Ash. These and others are questions by which, individually and collectively, they serve as the basis by which we are intended to come to the conclusion that the Bible is not God's word, but rather a collection of myths and fables only to be believed by the simple-minded and the gullible. However, in truth, these 33 and a myriad remaining others are nothing more than apparent contradictions which exist and remain largely, if not exclusively, due in fact to Mr. Ash's inability or unwillingness to do his research, coupled with his unwillingness to open his mind and heart to God and his word. This concludes this episode. Now, if you have any questions about God, the Bible, or the Christian faith, I encourage you to send me an email at pastor underscore Yeshua at yahoo.com. That's P-A-S-T-O-R underscore Y-E-S-H-U-A at yahoo.com. Thank you for listening. The world falls around me, I rest. I know that he has found me. Christ the rock is my foundation. I will trust in